Welcome to Music Crush, a new music podcast hosted by the Flute New Music Consortium. I'm Nicole Reiner. And I'm Elizabeth Robinson. If you like the show, please rate and review it on the platforms wherever you listen to podcasts, particularly on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find us and grow the show. And of course, you can learn more about Flute New Music Consortium at flutenewmusicconsortium.com. Christian Yam is a Korean-American composer, pianist, and improviser from New York, currently based in Cambridge. Starting composition in 2022, Christian's music draws from an ever-increasing musical and extra-musical palette, among them the synthesis of traditional Korean folk and Western music idioms, the drawing of expression from unique timbral and color combinations, the vast structural constructions of Beethoven, the note-by-note intention of Takamitsu and of Ravel, the harmony and drive of jazz, and even the delight of Korean food, all of which are laced into his tightly knit and ever-expanding body of work. Christian has already racked up the prizes, winning a 2023 Morton Gould Young Composer Award, a 2023 Young Arts Finalist in Classical Music, a 2022 National Young Composers Challenge Ensemble winner, and the 2022 National First Place winner in MTNA's Senior Composition Competition. He is currently enrolled at the Harvard University and New England Conservatory through the BA MM program. And we know Christian from his 2023 winning FNMC composition competition piece, Sensori, for alto flute and C flute double, harp and string quartet. Welcome, Christian. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. So Christian, is it true that you just started school this year? Yeah, it's my first semester of college. Um, Semester's wrapping up in about two weeks, and everything's pretty crazy right now, but I'd say it's been a pretty fruitful experience thus far. Elizabeth and I both teach at the college level, of course, um, and so we we see all kinds of challenges that people go through, especially that first semester, which is just the weirdest, right? It feels so weird compared to the rest of your life that's come beforehand. Looking back, uh, this is this is maybe unfair. You'll you'll have more wisdom at the end of the year and and you know in in subsequent years. But right now, what's your takeaway from this first semester? Any any words of wisdom for other students listening, or any uh, brilliant breakthroughs you've had with time management or anything like that? Funny you mentioned time management because I think that's what I was going to talk about. I came into college knowing that I wanted to do both music and some form of academics. I still don't know what I'm majoring in, but uh, we're figuring it out as we go. And part of that is that I, I'm basically doing two different schools. I'm at Harvard studying. I mean, as I said before, I have no idea what I'm studying. Um, but right now I'm taking math and economics and whatnot. Um, and I'm simultaneously a student at New England Conservatory. So I have to balance both music and academics on a daily basis. And that was a lot harder than I thought, because I thought it would be a continuation of high school where academics necessarily uh, didn't take very much time or energy and music was where most of my life was devoted to. But now it's it's a pretty even 50-50 split. And I I mean, I, I had a lot of fun during orientation and little did I know, like three weeks later, um, kept having fun and did not get that much work done. So please, like, if you, if you have an expectation of how much you want to get done, schedule accordingly, use your Google calendar, um, and just also be realistic with yourself. Because I think uh, I think it's, it's very easy to fall into the trap of uh, expecting too much and then feeling bad about how much you've gotten done in a day. I know that's a pitfall I fall into quite often, but it'll it'll all work out sometimes breaks are more productive than doing a whole ton of work so you can re-energize yourself for the next day next hour the next week you know however however long you need so do you do you, are you are you catching the train constantly between two campuses for your, your yeah journey? so the harvard nec dual degree works uh for the first three years as like nec functions as weekly lessons for uh studio lessons so uh, every week on Monday at 5.30 p.m., I take the one bus um, to Nubian Station and I get off at Symphony Hall and then um, make my way to NEC and then I commute back. So it's like it's a it's a three hour time commitment um, for commute and uh, actually being at NEC. And then the rest of the time I'm at Harvard, either writing or doing schoolwork or hang out with friends. And yeah, it's it's been it's been very fun, though. I look forward to it every week. 
it's been a minute since I lived in a place with a three hour commute, but I, I do remember <laughs> there were various ways that people like to spend their commute. What's your commute pastime passage of choice? So, okay, I don't actually commute for three hours. It's just like the commute and then being at NEC and then commuting oh, back to Harvard. I see, I see. The total I of see. three hours, yeah. Okay, okay. And that makes it a little yeah. bit less intense. Oh, but you asked, uh, how do I like to spend the commute? Yeah, are you a reader? Are you a music listener? Are you a napper? I, I love listening to music always. Often I try and like, if it's a especially long commute, I like knowing what exactly I'm going to see along the route and then trying to match the music to what I'd probably see. It just makes the experience like a lot more in the moment. And I don't know, I feel like music amplifies uh, my emotion and how I, how I view things. And it's just, it's fun for me. <laughs> wow, so you're like creating soundtracks for your commutes. Yeah, so for NEC, I'm in the city a lot. So I just, I just listen to hip hop on the way and it just kind of energizes me. Well, can we talk about the what I think is clearly the most important aspect of your bio? Can you talk to us about food? Oh boy, <laughs> how I love food! Um, what are your so so? You mentioned that 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 uh, plays a role in your music in terms of inspiration. How does food show up in your music? Um, one of the pieces I'm kind of juggling with a whole lot of other projects is a piece for orchestra called Panjang. Basically, I take my associations with each like little plate of Korean food that you get um, at the beginning of, for example, a Korean barbecue meal. And um, I kind of take my musical associations with like adjectives I'd use to describe the food. Like I finished the first movement called Candied Potatoes, which in my opinion is probably one of the best plates of banchan and not every place has it so you gotta you gotta find the right ones but the place that i go to near my home it's always it's always it comes nice and warm the outside is nice and it's nice and hardened by like the honey that they use and then you crunch into it on the inside it's soft so i tried and capture the feeling of, of biting into something um like crunchy like the opening motif is is this crunchy like crunchy xylophone line and then it immediately leads into the wind sustaining uh, the pitches of the xylophone. So it's like crunch, 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 and then smooth winds. And then it builds and builds and builds into the, like the moment where you're just like, ah, I love this. And then I, I'm planning other movements that I still need to, <laughs> I still need to develop more. Um, but for example, I, I want to do like a kimchi movement, particularly uh, justice because I love it so much. Yeah, all those, all of those musical associations uh, with the food are, are are used to like propel my ideas, and yeah, it's just it's a lot of fun. Oh, any other any other favorite dishes that you would recommend we go out and try to find in our hometowns? Um, if you have a if you have any Korean place, they probably sh they probably should sell sundubuchige. Which is it was essentially a soft tofu stew and like a spicy it. seafood broth. It's delicious. If you have a bowl of rice and you pour a little bit of it into the rice, and then maybe add a little bit of seafood and then eat uh and then try and like make the perfect combination of a bite, it hits every single time. Yeah, I love that too. I live in a place, Elizabeth lives in a place where it's pretty hard to find authentic ingredients. You might mm. not. It might be it might I'm sure it's much better in Boston, but do you ever find um that like, do you do any cooking at home? Do you find that you have to make substitutions because we don't we don't have the right ingredients here in the States? So my grandparents, luckily enough, are very particular about uh, the ingredients that they use to make mm -hmm. their Korean food. So they always uh, they always commute to H Mart, which is about like 40 minutes away from my home. And if you don't know what H Mart is, it's essentially an Asian grocery and they sell a whole array of authentic in my in my case very very high quality authentic korean ingredients so i've never really had the the issue of like authentic korean ingredients uh, because my grandparents are so devoted and adamant about getting the right things but uh yeah if i if i had to say to make substitution if you want to make korean food go ahead i mean it, it, it'll probably end up tasting pretty similar i mean yeah i've never tried it but I, i'd want to you may someday. Yeah, I think I might have to someday. <laughs> and for for those who are listening and have just vaguely heard of uh, H Mart, it may be from Michelle Zauner's memoir, Crying in H Mart. 
Mm, highly yes. recommend. If you I also it. highly recommend. Yeah. I read that on the on a plane ride to San Diego and it was like it just got me in my feels before I I, I saw yeah, some friends. Yeah. Switching gears away from the snacks, what kind of advice are you getting in school in terms of collaborating with performers or favoring certain types of ensembles? So as for advice at school, NEC is very good. Or uh, New England Conservatory, which is the the second half of my education, they they they're very open about um, the types of ensembles that you would write for and the instrumentation and like particular aesthetic for said instrumentation. They're very open minded about all of it. So really, if if you have an idea and there's an ensemble to accommodate that idea. I'm just I I'm in the environment where you should just go for it. And if there's a particular like performer or if there's a piece of music that you already have, uh, an ensemble could potentially play. You should also go for it. Like a lot of my musician friends also doing the dual degree. I already have like pieces that I want to write for them. And one right now who's a solo guitarist at Reed Park. Uh, I'm writing a I'm writing a guitar piece for him because I've always wanted to write for guitar, but I wanted to. I wanted to try and expand um, the guitar repertoire into something that is like really, really delves into harmonics. And I, I had the avenue to do that because of, because of the program. And I, I mean, NEC is always so good about um, providing like that mentality to just go for it. So I just did. And I think a fruitful collaboration is, is, is happening. Yeah, there are times where you're lucky enough to have ensembles that want you to write for them. Uh, so like the Harvard Battleship Chamber players, which I'm very excited to write for, I reached out to me and they wanted me to write a piece for their for their ensemble, which is comprised of 13 strings. And I've just been I've been trying to think of how to do it justice uh, since. Uh, as for more advice that I've been given, my teacher always tries and uh, pushes me to uh, to like create new uh, challenges to solve and give fresh perspective on every single piece. Uh, in my opinion, it makes the composition process a lot more sustainable. I often have a hard time of comparing myself to what I've previously written. So presenting a new and fresh challenge to yourself gives you just a completely new and fresh perspective to where you have no baseline or, or, or benchmark to, to work towards. And you just do where your where your nose leads you, you know? And I, th I think that's the most fun. Really excited to hear that you're in a place in life where literally your imagination is the limit. So I, I think my mm. follow-up question is, you know, you've, you've been wanting to write a piece for guitar and it sounds like that's happening for you. What are some mm -hmm. other things you hope that you're able to squeeze into your time at NEC? Oh, future project. So I'm currently drafting a piece for solo percussion. It's it's through an avenue of a lot of combined inspiration. At Harvard, there's a mandatory writing class called Xbox 20, which is essentially just like your intro to like argumentative academic writing. And I happen to have this uh, seminar or my particular topic in the, in the writing seminar is on like the rationality of supernatural beliefs. And so for our final project, our our assignment is to choose a a mode of thought um, or religion of some sort to further research and i chose korean shamanism which is super cool because i knew of uh i knew of shamanist music uh before before choosing the topic so i because i'm like almost i'm urged to learn so much about shamanism and i had an inkling of an interest in shamanist music it's it's really providing the avenue to create music out of uh this this like burst of inspiration i've had shamanist music also in gugak it's it's known as shinawi it, it it heavily involves percussion and so suddenly like all these percussive moments and sounds were popping into my head and i wanted to coherently combine it into into a piece of music using my own voice i i'm, I'm drafting it right now and it's been probably the most fun i've had with compositions since sun city so yeah well, speaking of Sansori, um, your recording that you feature on your website of that piece is performed by musicians from the Orlando Philharmonic. How did you connect mm. with them? I connected to them through a competition I submitted to called the National Young Composers Challenge. And I had absolutely no expectation going in. I just, I submitted on a whim. I saw the, I'm, one of my friends referred me to the application. And so I submitted, hope for the best. 
And luckily enough, I got it. The perks of being a winner is that your piece that you submitted gets performed by some members of the Orlando Philharmonic. And so in my case, uh, Sound City got the opportunity to get played by the Orlando Phil. And so I got to talk with the musicians, um, hear all about their their artistic paths and their their visions for the future. And uh, through them and through the National Young Composers Challenge, I've connected with so many great musicians and also the Orlando Contemporary Chamber Music Players, I believe that's their name, also decided to play the piece again because they enjoyed playing it. I just really, for all young composers out there, I'd recommend you to submit everywhere you can. You re- don't don't be scared about rejection. Rejection is, is, is something that I've personally faced quite a bit and something that I'm, I'm sure everyone will face at some point, unless you're some superhuman. But please don't be afraid of it because the... The app, uh, it just closes the door. And I think you should open every door you can. By doing so, just submit. Don't be afraid and believe in your artistic vision and your voice. And uh, I think good things will come out. And speaking of your voice, Sansori went on to win the FNMC composition competition, which is part mm-hmm. of what brings us to having this conversation. For our listeners and our members who haven't taken the time to explore your score yet, what can you tell us about its backstory and its inspiration? In the summer of 2022, I was just off the heels of uh, finishing a shin quartet. And towards the end of the shin quartet, I really discovered Kugak, which is uh, essentially the huge umbrella term for traditional Korean folk music. Um, and particularly, there's this form of uh, traditional Korean folk called pansori, which rises of a singer and a changu player, which is, changu is a, it's a two, it's a two-sided hourglass drum and it accompanies the singer. And what was pernic- was particularly uh, resonant to me about the, uh, the form was the just the sheer emphasis on emotionality and and conveying those emotions to the voice rather than putting so much emphasis on technical ability and hitting the right notes. That to me really just, it sparked kind of this obsession into trying to find all the pansori I could. And one particular video, I don't even know where, how I found it. It, it just, it, it popped up through just my search histories. And uh, it was this woman singing pansori by the waterfall or by a waterfall and the combination of these natural sounds of like water just trickling off of the stones and when some like occasionally flowing into the into the camera feedback and the woman just gracefully practicing her craft uh just was so it was so striking to me and i really wanted to capture that in in a piece of music and I luckily had the opportunity to write for an ensemble that would fit that, would fit the bill for that type of music, uh, which was for harp, flute, and string quartet. And so um, instead of a vocalist, I used a flute uh, to try and imitate the the voice of a pansori singer, as well as the the technical aspects of a taken or a bamboo flute. So it was kind of a hybrid mix of the two. And then I tried to use the all the natural surroundings, such as the the wind and the earthiness of the of the rocks, and then the water trickling down onto the rocks. Um, I use that as the kind of background vehicle for the for the flute through the harp and the string quartet. And so, when you listen to the piece, I try and keep that image in your mind. And if you, I mean, if if it really uh, if it really hits the right notes with you, maybe just make your own image in your mind and, and use it for your own inspiration. And yeah, actually, I, I wouldn't recommend any particular listening style. I'd say just listen to it and I hope you enjoy. Your website lists your avocations as pianist, composer, and improviser. Tell us about your choice to include improviser. Uh, that's a great question. A lot of my starts start with uh, just a simple ditty that I improvised on the piano. Before I composed, I, I noticed that I just, when I practiced piano, when I used to be very serious about piano performance, uh, a lot of my supposedly hour-long practice sessions would just spiral off into me improvising. And that's when I noticed that I really, really wanted to create something of my own musically. Because for for piano performance, at least, my favorite part of playing piano was always discovering new rep and discovering like composers' intentions, why exactly they made certain decisions, and what exactly their their like exigencies were for writing a piece. 
uh, and then exploring all the musical qualities and extra musical qualities of a piece of music. And so with that in mind, uh, I did I often did that with improvisation. Like I'd play a piece of music and then I'd improvise what the music, what I what I thought the music was trying to say. It was then where I kind of figured that I should start writing. And I happened to know a great composer whose name is Dr. Paul Frucht who runs the Charles Ives Music Festival. And he was also the avenue in which I discovered contemporary classical music. And uh, he presented in a way in which I immediately fell in love, which is often rare for contemporary classical music. I think, yeah, I think the Charles Ives Music Festival did a great job in, in, in a gradual and, and uh, ex- uh, accessible introduction into contemporary classical music. And so with all these, uh, with all these inspirations, or uh, I guess, motivating factors it led me eventually to, to write my first piece for piano by all means it, it's so rough and it really was just me trying to trying to write but i mean it, it's it's that start you you i think overcoming that barrier of, of thinking that you can become a composer and that you should write i think that's always just it's the most important step and it's the hardest step going back to the improvisation thing um, i kind of spiral into a tangent Still, all of my ideas for, not all, but most of my musical ideas often come from a simple improvisation on piano. And if I find that something that clicks and something I can further develop in my mind, I do so. And I kind of, uh, I don't know, I, I, I found that improvising, not necessarily like physically, but in my mind, like improvising the form of a piece or improvising like spontaneously, like what musical effect would happen at, at this moment in time where I have something formulated in my head really helps with developing a piece of music because I find that when I try and and write everything out and, and meticulously and pragmatically figure out how a piece should go, it, it just often sounds stilted and like I'm, I'm forcing myself to say something. Whereas if I just simply sit down and just think, close my eyes and just think and improvise like, What's gonna happen here? I often find that uh, it, it leads to a more authentic musical voice, and that isn't to say that my compositions don't necessarily like rely on on a predetermined formal structure. I shouldn't say predetermined, but I often I'm very conscious of the architecture of a piece. So on a, on a sheet of paper, I'd like graph out moments of tension release and what happens with each like section of the music, and then I fill in the gaps by just either thinking, improvising, sometimes just putting pen to paper and, and, and seeing what comes of it. But yeah, I, I use improviser because a lot of my composition practice is, is based around improvisation. And also I just, I like improvising as its own thing. I'm trying to do a project where I improvise every day um, and then record it. And then hopefully I maybe just post it online or something for fun. Something to take, take the stress off of academic coursework i feel like you you've gotten into this a little bit already but i i'm I'm gonna ask it again and just see if there's anything hiding under a rug here because we like to ask this of of all of our guests what's on your workbench so a guitar piece percussion piece anything else that you're cooking up right now cooking up is a it's a good term i love that i love cooking up yeah so i'm i'm currently formulating a piece for a large symphonic orchestra to just kind of kind of just see where it takes me in terms of of something just kind of wild I I wanted to go for something that I haven't necessarily done before and exploring a whole uh, array of orchestral effects and and statements in, in a way that is cohesive and something I can like meld into my own voice so all these very abstract thoughts and statements I just made uh, are, are, are because I haven't like necessarily started like any formal planning, but I, I've, I've kind of created these moments in my head that I want music to, to lead to and to uh, embody as, as an important like touchstone of the work. And they're all just, they're all moments that I, I think speak to how I want my music to progress. I'm very enthusiastic about, about the music of Ravel. Um, and I feel as though that it's just his intention of every single note place where they need to be in a fashion that's idiomatic, that progresses form, that speaks to the heart in such a in such an eloquent combinatorial fashion is like is, is something that I, I I I strive for. He often has these moments where just like wow, like that's just that's incredible. 
And I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do something like that. Ravel is always such a treat. I've always wondered. Oh yeah. How he is, how he manages to be so excellent at writing for every instrument. You know, I think, <laughs> I think, I think Ravel is, is truly like one of those, those edge cases of, of are you human at, at some points? Like, <laughs> like his orchestration is so technically sound that it often becomes the focal point of the piece rather than like, what is the piece trying to say? Or what is the programmatic aspect of the piece? Like in the waltz, for example, it's this, this waltz like slowly decaying and, and being catastrophic, like being wrought by catastrophe and, and all these chromatic lines. Um, but it's orchestrated so well that it just becomes it, that just becomes what I focus on. I just I just look at the orchestration marvel. I mean, that isn't to say that the emotional effect isn't just it's so it's so pervasive and it, it really it rings it rings just so effectively. I don't fully know and I don't know if I'll ever know why Ravel is so good at what he does, but I just know that he is and I I wanna just live and breathe his music and so many other great composers' music. Yeah, and really appreciate that just just excellence. We kind of touched on this at the beginning of our conversation, but I have been enjoying asking many of our composers if they could sort of manifest the ideal or dream collaboration. Who would they be working with and what would they be mm. working on? So Christian, what's your dream collaboration? It's a great question. Um, I feel like it would change over time. Right now, I really, I'm really like in intrigued by the idea of a concerto for multiple solo instruments okay i feel as though i feel as though it just it opens up a whole new like dimension of of, of dialogue um because normally it's like soloist i um i'm speaking with or against or something with the orchestra or speaking with themselves against themselves like this it's always very solo and orchestra or solo with orchestra but what about like an ensemble with themselves and the orchestra like you can create so many new avenues and like opening up this this new dimension of possibility, like, like literally a whole entire new axis of, of possibility that I don't think I could do justice right now, but I, I definitely want to explore sometime in the future. And I would want to do a concerto for multiple instruments with like a traditional Korean ensemble. I don't know, like an assortment of uh, of different Korean instruments like uh, Daegum or Kakayim or and the Changu or whatever, like some combination of uh, traditional Korean instruments which I can explore their both their combinatorial like timbres and expressive and dialogue capabilities with the expressive and just like truly like world encapsulating power of the orchestra and I think that's that's something that I definitely at some point if I'm if I'm graced that opportunity if I'm fortunate enough to have the opportunity I'll I'll take it by the reins but uh, yeah, that's a dream, and I'm, I'm here to work towards that. Well, Christian, we always like to close with this question, and I'm going to adjust it a little bit for you so that we can take full advantage of your expertise. Uh, what are three Korean pieces of music you'd like our audience to explore? I'd say I'm gonna I'm gonna bend my answer a little bit to talk about three genres of traditional Korean music, so that oh. it's more than just a piece. Yeah, it's a whole like exploration of a. Uh, different different pieces of the form and the first one i mentioned is pansuri i really recommend starting to just understand and listen to pansuri and and not necessarily what the performer is saying i really i think you don't have to understand korean at all to understand what the performer is trying to say and really just sink into just the the expressiveness the expressiveness and the emotionality of the voice um i think there's something kind of a uh, transcendental about the music that 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 that, sp that speaks particularly um to the heart uh another one another musical form is called sanjo and essentially it literally means scattered melodies but in the way uh, in the more like more western music explanation of the of the, of the form it, it kind of starts really slow and it comprises of generally uh instead of the voice it's it's an instrument of uh some some like traditional Korean instrument usually and a changu and it starts super slow and slowly but surely it gradually increases the excitement builds um they're more like exclamations from the performer the the the, ad, the audience gets into the music and it just builds and builds it gets faster and faster and, and more exciting 
um, until it eventually can't anymore, it just stops. And it's, 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 it's truly a spectacle. I don't think you have to understand traditional Korean music to understand um, what exactly Sanjo is trying to say. Um, that being said, you, sh you should try and understand what traditional Korean folk music is all about because I think there's it's a whole world of possibility and it's, it's a whole world of uh, such like culturally enriching music. And then finally, because of my percussion piece that I'm doing, because I'm learning about it right now, I'd look at Shinai, which is shamanist music. It's really, it's really so broad, and there isn't a term I'd exactly use to pinpoint um, what it is. But it's often played with kut or uh, shamanist rituals, and I look at both, and particularly the music that backs the shamanist rituals because uh, it usually is accompanied by some form of music. And uh, if it happens to be shinoi, then you should do it. Yeah, I think that's 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 all. Well, Christian, thank you so much for sharing some time with us and letting us get to know you and your artistic process and your winning piece, Sensori, a little bit more. Of course, of course. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Music Crush. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also support the podcast, read show notes, and learn more about FNMC by visiting www.flutenewmusicconsortium.com. <laughs> <laughs>